Hello and welcome to the Ultimate Git 5-Day Challenge. This course is designed to give you a brief introduction to using Git to store your files in a local repository and also in a remote repository, either at GitHub or Bitbucket. You can choose, or you can do both if you'd like extra practice. Essentially, we're going to do a quick 5-day step-by-step walkthrough where we're going to cover some of the basic Git operations that you would do if you were working with Git on your own. We aren't going to go into the deep details of Git. This is essentially just a quick overview to see if it's something that you want to pursue further. And this course is designed to make things fairly straightforward and easy for you to complete in a daily manner for five days. And so I'm looking forward to working with you, and I hope that you will enjoy the Ultimate Git 5-Day Challenge. Thank you very much. Let's go ahead and get started. Hello and welcome to day one of the Ultimate Get 5 Day Challenge. Today, we're going to take a look at getting an account at GitHub and Bitbucket. Now, you don't have to do both, but you could if you want some extra practice. Now, GitHub is probably one of the world's most popular places to store your code in a remote repository, and it's where you'd want to go if you're going to be working on open source projects, as well as just keeping your own code there if you'd like to share it with the world. And I also included Bitbucket because it's essentially the same thing as GitHub. But the nice thing about Bitbucket is it does offer the chance to have unlimited free repositories for small teams or an individual. And so if you're interested in keeping your code private, Bitbucket's a good opportunity for you to do that. For the rest of the course, we'll be using GitHub, but using Bitbucket would be very similar to GitHub. So at the end of this day, we'll have gone through getting an account at GitHub and Bitbucket, and also we'll have set up a repository that we can use to store our code at both GitHub and Bitbucket. And again, all you need to do is one of them, so if you complete the activities for GitHub, you could be done with today's work. And so that's our goals for day one. Let's go ahead and get started. Hello and welcome to our next video. In this lesson, we're going to get set up with an account at GitHub.com. So we'll be looking at two different sites throughout our course, github.com and bitbucket.com. You can choose which one you would like to work with to store your repos at a remote location, and you can do both if you so desire to see the differences between the two or just want extra practice. So in this video, we're going to go ahead and get set up for an account at github.com, and that will be, again, probably the most popular site that is available in the world today and most of your open source repos are going to actually exist on github.com so if you're looking to get into open source development and contributing to projects you'll probably be looking at github.com a lot so here we're going to go ahead and click on sign up and again we're at github.com clicking on sign up will bring us to a page to sign up for a new account and so you need to enter a username and just keep in mind that this is going to be something that will basically be shared publicly. So it will be your repo location. So I'm just gonna go ahead and use my company name, Major Guidance Solutions. And then I'm gonna go ahead and enter my email address as brian at majorguidancesolutions.com. And I need to enter a password. There are some password restrictions, so just make sure that you follow what they need and go ahead and click on create the account. Of course, you would want to read the terms of service and the privacy policy. And I'm gonna go ahead and store my password. Not that it matters, I'll remember it, but you know, just in case. So you do have the choice on GitHub to do some private repositories. It does cost $7 a month if you want to keep your code private. And so that's definitely an option. I'm gonna go ahead and just select unlimited public repositories for free. And basically that will just make my code public to the world. But most likely nobody's going to find it anyway, or if it is, it'll be you guys that are doing the course, so it's not a big deal. And so you can also change that at any time. And if I want to do an organization, I can do that. I'm not going to. I'm just an individual tonight, so I'm just going to do that. And so then it asks you a few questions about where are you at with programming, and I'm basically going to use this for development, uh, project management, uh, other uh, teaching. <laughs> And, you know, just backing up my files. And so uh, whatever you want to use there. And what am I? I'm probably a professional, I guess. And what am I interested in? I'm interested in all kinds of things. Uh, I'm just going to say C-sharp. 
.NET, Java, JavaScript, Angular, etc. So uh, we'll put web development on there too. Submit that and that goes ahead and creates my account at GitHub. So I can see here that I do have an account. I'm signed in, I have profile, stars, all that stuff that I can do. And basically I can create repositories and other things here as I need to. But that's going to wrap up our video on getting set up with an account at GitHub. Thank you very much and we'll see you next time. Hello and welcome to our next video. In this lesson, we're going to go ahead and create our first repository at GitHub. So when we do this, we're going to create our first remote repository, which means that it's going to be stored somewhere else, not on our local machine. And so our remote repositories, if we're using GitHub, are going to be stored at github.com. Now, I just signed up for an account, so I need to verify my email address. And I would notice that as I go to create my first repo. So I'm going to do that here. And just so you know, in case you didn't figure this out already, if I say repo, it usually means I'm referring to a repository. And I can create a new repo by starting a new project here or by clicking up here on the plus symbol and selecting new repository. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. And it says, of course, I need to verify my email address since I just signed up. So I'm going to go ahead and do that real quick. And I'll pause the video. You should do that as well in case you needed to do this. All right, so I have verified my email. I'm going to go ahead and hit F5. Oh, it's not the page I'm looking for. That's fantastic. So it says I'm unverified. So let's just remove this because I am verified. And look, there I am. So let's go ahead and create our new repository now. And so what you'll note is that you have a drop-down list for the owner of your repo. So since you're probably the only one on your account, it will be you, and that's the way you would want it. And for our repository name, let's just go ahead and call it First Repo. It really doesn't matter what we call it as long as it's available and makes sense. And so then it says we need to give it a description. This is our first repository. Now, we could make it private, but if we do that, of course, we need to enter our credit card information so or PayPal. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and leave it public because I'm not going to spend any money on this first repo. And note that we can do this thing down here where we initialize the repository with a readme. So we can go ahead and do that. That just gives a readme file. It'll let you do some stuff with taking notes or making notes of what your repo is supposed to do. If you already had an existing repo, it does say to go ahead and skip this step, and that's fine. The other thing we can do is add a .gitignore file, and it's okay if you don't know what that is right now. Uh, we don't re really need to do that. And so what you would do, let's say you were doing Java, you could say I want to add a java.gitignore. Or if you're doing .NET, you would do a Visual Studio gitignore. And so I'm going to go ahead and with the Visual Studio. and you can add a license. And the nice thing about this is it actually tells you what these licenses mean. If you want to know more, you can click on this little info button and it tells you what each of these licenses mean and what would work for you. So I encourage you to read through these and see which one works the best. I'm going to go ahead with the MIT license for mine. And I'm just going to say MIT license here. And I'm going to go ahead and create the repository. And what we'll see is that I now have a repository at Major Guidance Solutions called First Repo. And note that the URL is github.com major guidance solutions slash first repo. Right now there's no code, there's no issues, there's no pull requests, there's no projects, there's a wiki, but there's nothing in it. Settings aren't really uh, set up and some insights about code and contributions, which of course right now are nothing. But it did add the license, the readme, and then get ignore file to my initial commit in my first repo. And that is all we need to do to have a repo set up at GitHub. So that concludes our video on setting up our first repository at GitHub. Thank you very much, and we'll see you next time. Hello and welcome to our next video. In this lesson, we're going to go ahead and get set up with an account at bitbucket.org. So as I mentioned in the GitHub video, if you've already watched that one, the two choices of places that are most popular at this point to store Git repositories in a remote location online are GitHub and Bitbucket. So I'm including bitbucket.org 
as an optional path for you here. But just keep in mind that for the rest of the course, we'll be doing everything at GitHub. So most everything, if not everything, that we can do at GitHub, we can do at Bitbucket and vice versa. They're essentially the same types of things, just different providers. But I wanted to give you this option because Bitbucket has a nice feature of a free repository without having to pay anything. So if you want to keep your code private for some reason, like you have some proprietary stuff you want to store or you just don't want people to have access to your code ever, you could use Bitbucket. And it has some nice tools and it's very easy to work with as well. Again, we're just going to set up an account here at Bitbucket today and then everything else we'll be doing, uh, we'll create our first repo here so we can kind of get a feel for that as well. Uh, but then after that, everything else we'll be doing everything at GitHub going forward. So that just means that if you do take the Bitbucket path, which is, again, a very valid choice, you will have to do a little bit of discovery on your own in order to get things to work the same way we see on GitHub. So let's go ahead and get started for free here. And we need to get set up with an account. And so once again, I'm just gonna use my Major Guidance Solutions account. And we'll go ahead and enter my full name and a password and verify that I'm not a robot. And yay, I get to pick some street signs. Hopefully I do this right. These always freak me out. What if I pick the wrong thing? What if that's actually a sign and it's not? Uh, okay, does that count? I probably screwed up. All right. So I can again save my account information here. And once again, with Bitbucket, just like with GitHub, I need to verify my email. So I'm gonna go ahead and do that really quickly and get that taken care of. All right, so now that I've verified my email at Bitbucket, I need to enter my username. So once again, this is gonna be my URL and my username. So I'm just going to go ahead and say Major Guidance Solutions. And I'm going to go ahead and continue. And it just makes sure that that hasn't been taken before. And once that's done, I am set up and ready to go with Bitbucket. And so that wraps up our video on getting an account set up with Bitbucket. Thank you very much, and we'll see you next time. Hello and welcome to our next video. In this lesson, we're going to go ahead and get our first repository created at Bitbucket. So just like we did at GitHub, we would have the opportunity here to do a repository at Bitbucket. And so again, I'm just gonna click on the plus symbol, create a new repository. And once again, I need a repository name. And so I'm going to call this first repo, just like before. It's going to be private, which is awesome. And we can actually do Git or Mercurial. And we're going to be using Git. And if we wanna take a look at the advanced settings, we can say, you know, this is our first repository. And we can allow only private forks or no forks or allow forking all we want. And so we don't even know what that is yet. So let's just leave what it says and we can fix it later if we have to. Do we want issue tracking? Do we want a wiki? I don't know. Maybe, maybe not. And so for right now, well, let's just leave them off. And since this is just going to be our first repo, it really probably won't matter. Uh, later, when we get into more advanced stuff, we probably would want issue tracking and a wiki. Now, issue tracking is going to be more important if you're on a team or if you're exposing your code to the public and you want them to allow, um, you want to allow them to submit things to you and you can say, this is my issue and this is when it will be fixed and all that jazz. Uh, so definitely more advanced stuff there. Now, what language are you programming in? Are you in C Sharp? Are you in Java? Are you doing HTML? Are you doing something else? It really doesn't matter so much other than this just gives it a really nice icon to go along with what you're doing. So again, I'm gonna go ahead with the C-sharp route here. You can choose whatever makes sense to you. If you're using HipChat, which is another Atlassian program that they have, they have a suite of programs that are really nice for team collaboration. I'm not affiliated, I'm just saying they're very nice. HipChat is very popular. You can actually wire up some webhooks and have HipChat notify uh, in the room or have Bitbucket notify your HipChat room, you know, hey, there's a pull request to review or hey, somebody can go ahead and check in the repo or somebody did check in a change or whatever it might need to be to inform your team. 
Now for right now, it's just gonna be us, ourselves. So again, we're gonna just turn off issue tracking. We're gonna turn off wiki. We're gonna turn off enable hip chat. And again, you could leave those on. It really doesn't matter at this point. So we'll go ahead and create the repository. And there again, we can see bitbucket.org, major guidance solutions slash first repo is the actual location of our repository. And that's important because when we go to work with this repository later, we'll do something called cloning it and we'll need that link. Same thing that we'll do with our GitHub repo as well. And you can always get your repository URL from the top line here at Bitbucket as well. So right now you can take a look around. There's no source, there's no commits, there's no branches, none of that. And we're gonna learn about those things as we go through the more advanced course here. And so as we continue to study Git, we'll learn more about what all of this stuff mean. For now, that wraps up our creation of our first repo at Bitbucket. Thank you very much, and we'll see you next time. Hello and welcome to the reflection on day one. So this is just basically a quick reminder of what we went through today. So at the completion of today, we have set up a repository and an account at GitHub or Bitbucket or both. And so now's the time to make sure that we've mastered this and make sure that we are in control and command of these actions. So obviously setting up an account isn't something we have to do very often. And so we shouldn't have to worry about that. But if we're not quite sure yet what it means to set up a repository, that's kind of okay because we really haven't gotten that deep into the course. But if you wanted, you could practice by setting up a couple more repositories just to practice the action of creating the repositories. But really that's all there was to day one. And so I'm looking forward to seeing you again tomorrow for day two. Thank you very much. We'll see you then. Hello everyone. Welcome to day two. So yesterday with day one, we completed the setting up an account at GitHub or Bitbucket and then created our first remote repository. So that's awesome. And now it's time for us to get Git on our own machine. So today we're going to cover getting set up with Git on our local machine for Windows and Linux and Mac. And then we're going to take the time to set up our first local repository. So at the end of today, we'll have Git working on our machines and we'll have our own first local repository to go along with our first remote repository. That way we'll be able to start seeing the difference between those two as we go through the course. I'm looking forward to working with you during day two. So let's go ahead and get started. Hello and welcome to our next video. In this lesson, we're going to get Git on our Windows machine. So I just typed Git for Windows into a simple Google search, and we're looking at Windows-Git as the top result for the git-scm.com. So we're going to go ahead and open that, and it will automatically start a download when I hit this. But what I want is the 64-bit for Windows, and if you're on a 32-bit machine, you would just get that. So I already have 64-bit downloaded, so go ahead and get that started here. Even though it's still downloading the second version of it, we're going to go ahead and install the first one that I had downloaded. And we'll go ahead and run it. And we will allow it to make changes to the computer. And then we get our setup information for Git 2.13.1 at the time of this recording. So I'm just going to go ahead and breeze through that. Of course, I read it and hit next. I'm going to install it to C program files git. Tells me how much space is needed, etc. I do want to go ahead and get git bash and git GUI. I'm going to leave git LFS, associate git star config files, associate.sh files to be run with bash. I'm not going to select use a true type font in all console windows. If you like that, you can go ahead and try that and use it. You don't need it, so I'm just going to leave it blank and just use whatever the default font is that it gives me. So. I'm going to go ahead and let it have a startup folder, no big deal. Um, you can say don't create it if you don't want it. It's not a big deal. You probably never use it. Maybe you will. So there are a bunch of different options coming up. We're just going to breeze through a few things and just know that you probably want to follow along with what I'm doing unless you have other reasons to do so. So it really doesn't matter if you're on a Windows machine which of the top two you select, except for if you want to be able to run from a basic command prompt versus having to use the git bash 
And so it's up to you which one of these you want to use. Either use git bash from git bash only, which is what I'm going to do. So that means I will have to run all of my git commands from inside the bash, git bash. And I won't be able to do that from a command prompt. If you want that, again, select get it from the command prompt. I highly recommend you don't select the bottom one unless you don't care that your basic DOS commands might get overwritten with some Unix commands. So if you're very familiar with Unix commands and want to go this route, you could do it. Uh, but again, I would select one of the top two. We're going to go ahead and use the OpenSSL library. And we're going to use this recommended setting for Windows, which is to check out Windows style and commit Unix style line endings. This is great for distributed teams when you have people on multiple machines and sometimes all of them aren't Windows. It's great if you're working with Windows. It will make sure that the carriage return line feeds essentially work on your computer. And when you commit, it won't wreck anybody else's stuff. You could also check out as is and commit Unix style, but then you'll see a lot of prompts that say, hey, this isn't formatted for Windows. Would you like to reformat the file, which is really annoying. And you can check out as is and commit as is, but I would go ahead and not do that unless you really want to have all kinds of stuff going on. So definitely I would recommend the top window setting. I'm also going to leave the use men TTY, which is the default terminal for Git Bash. And we're going to go ahead and use that. We're not going to use the default console window. We want to enable the file system caching, and we definitely want to enable Git Credential Manager, which allows us to manage our username and password for different repos. We don't need symbolic links, so if you need them, you could read about this and figure out what it's all about, and maybe enable it if you'd like. This will take a moment to install. What I'm going to do is pause the video while this runs, and I will be back as soon as the installation is complete. So you should go ahead and pause the video now, and then when your installation completes, restart the video. All right, and you can see that the installation has completed. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and launch git bash. This will bring up the terminal, and I'm going to quickly change the settings here for the text. We're going to change this. So we'll make this about a size 16. Which will give us a little bit better view here. And all I'm going to do is just do a simple git dash dash version. And that tells me that I have git version 2.13.1.windows.1 on my machine. So it looks like I'm good to go for git. And so that wraps up our installation of Git on Windows. Thank you very much, and we'll see you next time. Hello, and welcome to our next video. In this lesson, we're going to get set up with Git on Ubuntu. And so this is, of course, a Linux installation. So if you are using Linux, hopefully you can do something similar, depending on which brand or version you're using. So what I'm going to do also is just make a quick confession that I'm not a Linux expert by any means, so I'm actually just following a guide here on help.ubuntu.com, LTS, server guide, git.html, to go ahead and get this installed. And essentially, we're just going to run sudo apt install git. And so that's what I'm going to do with the terminal, sudo apt install git. And of course, you need to enter your password. And it will download the packages and get everything installed and set up to go with Git on your install of Linux. And so it looks like it's already there because, of course, this is Linux. And so things are built in, such as Git and Java, which is awesome. So we are already at the newest version and we are good to go. So we could try to do an update, but it says we're at the newest version. so. Hopefully it would have done that if you want to go ahead and try to update. Of course you could. And we can just make sure that this is working. We can just say git fig help. And there it is. And so we got press H for help or Q to quit. So we'll just quit. And again, the cool thing about git is there are often different ways to do stuff. So we can say git help fig and get to the same place. So we note that git help and then the type of command that we want to run or git 
the command and then dash dash help will often be the way to get to help on the command we're looking for. Now that is all there is to getting set up to start working with Git on Linux. Thank you very much, and we'll see you next time. Hello and welcome to our next video. In this lesson, we're going to take the time to get Git installed on a Mac. So there's a couple hoops to jump through, but we'll see that as we go, and it may or may not happen for you. So basically, what we're going to want to do is go out to the git-scm.com slash download slash Mac, and we'll go ahead and click on click to download manually if it doesn't start automatically. So once we do, we just need to go out to SourceForge here. It takes us out there and it starts to download. So the download takes just a moment. I'll go ahead and pause the video till the download's completed and I'll start the video back up when the download has ended. Once the download is completed, we'll go ahead and get this started. Double click that and then we'll get the... package going here. And what we'll see is that it actually gives us an error that says we cannot do this because it's from an unidentified developer. So go ahead and click OK on that. And then what we need to do is go over into our system preferences. And we'll go to security and privacy. And in here, you'll see that it has this allow apps downloaded from, and we can actually click on the one that was failed because it's not from an identified developer, so we'll click open anyway. And then we'll go ahead and say open again. And this will allow us to go ahead and install the git package on our Mac. Let's go ahead and select continue. And once again, if you want to change your install location, you can, or just install the default, go ahead and install. And you'll need to enter your username and password, of course, for your machine. And it will take just a moment, and this will be installed on your Mac. And that is how we get Git on our Mac. So thank you very much. We'll see you next time. Hello and welcome to our next video. In this lesson, we're going to create our first local repository using the command git init. So as we go about this, if you've been following the course, so far you've created repository remotely at a site like GitHub or Bitbucket. Now that's great because that's where you're ultimately going to want to store your code is on a server somewhere else. And you'll be able to then connect to that, clone the repo, etc., which we'll learn about soon, and work with that code and ultimately have that stored somewhere else. So if your machine goes a haywire or if you lose your code or if you make a bunch of mistakes, you can just get a version of the code from the remote repository. But the work that you're going to be doing is going to be locally. And sometimes maybe you aren't going to start with a repo at a remote location. Maybe you're just going to be working locally and you want to create your own local repo and ultimately at some point then push that somewhere or just leave it local and have version control running right there in your own folder. So what I'm going to do is just go over a couple things here to create a local repo both on Linux and on Windows. And I want to do this again a little bit side by side to prove once again that the commands are Unix based and they work on both machines regardless of which machine I'm using. And this will also give us a chance if you're like me and not necessarily very familiar with Unix to have a chance to review these commands that you'll want to be using frequently to see directories and make directories and find out what your files are doing on the file system itself. So you can see here that both of these don't have a folder called gfbtf. So I'm going to go ahead and create that using makedir gfbtf. And then I'm going to go ahead and cd to gfbtf. And so if I could do an ls-al, I can see that there's nothing in this folder at this point, And it's basically the gfbtf root folder. And so what I'm going to do here is call, I'm just going to make a directory again. I'm going to call the second repo. And this gives me the ability then to create that. I'll change directory to second repo. And I should be able to just 
tab to that. And now using git init, I'm going to go ahead and create my first local repo, which is actually called second repo. And so you can see empty git repository has been initialized in my folder. And in fact, if I do an ls-al, once again, now I will see there is a dot git. I can then, if I want to, if I'm so inclined, charge into there, take a look around, and see what's all in there as far as different folders. Now, I'm not going to recommend you do anything much with that at this point, unless you really want to get brave, but you could really screw some stuff up for your local repo if you deleted some of those things, if there's anything you went in there. So we'll just go back and just know that that's there for future reference. And so we can see again here we have created a repo in second repo, and it's basically made a folder called .get, and that has all that information. So that's all there is to creating a repo. So if you don't care about Windows, you could move on to the next video. But if you just want to see these commands working again side by side in a Windows instance, in a bash command here on Windows, once again, I can run the same Unix commands that I was using before. So I'll just do make dir gfbtf, then I'll cd to gfbtf, and then I'll ls-al on my Windows machine and see that nothing's there. Now, there is one other thing here. I didn't need to create that second repo folder. What I can do is actually do git init second repo. And when I do this, that will actually create a new repository in the folder second repo. And that would have worked on Linux as well. And so you can again ls-al and see here I have a second repo. I can then move into that repo and then ls-al again. And again, see that I have the .get, so I can cd.get and ls-al, and look, it says git directory with an exclamation point, please don't do anything here. But anyway, there you can see both Unix uh, shells are ultimately working on Linux and on Windows. The Unix commands ls-al gives me the ability to list all my folder contents. I can see my directories, uh, changing directories to them with CD. I can make directories of mkdir. And if I wanted to get really brave, I could actually use remove commands as well to delete things. So for example, just to show that, I can go make dir. I'm inside git here, so let's actually cd up a level here. And then I'm going to make dir delete me and ls-al. And so what I want to do is actually do an rm-rf. That would remove any files that are inside of the folder. But be careful and make sure that you actually type the path to the folder you want to delete because that is recursive. It will wipe out anything that's in there, folders and files going forward, and that will just actually remove that. That gives us just a little bit more information and some basic Unix commands that you could use to do some folder work on your machine. And again, that's more for the people like me who aren't as familiar with Linux or Unix commands and just want to have a quick refresher on it. That wraps up our video on creating a local repository. Thank you very much, and we'll see you next time. Hello and welcome to the reflection for day two. Today, we took the time to get Git set up on our local computer and make sure that everything was working as expected so that we were able to start using the command line to interact with Git. We then wrapped up the day by creating our own local repository. So the local repository would be where we would want to store files. And if we were to want to push that out to GitHub or Bitbucket, we would have to set up a remote repository there and set up all the tracking to do that. Now we're not going to go to that level in this course, but I just wanted to put that out there in case that's something you're interested in in the future. What we will do tomorrow in day three is clone our repository and start working with it. So I'm looking forward to getting to that point with you. But today we've wrapped up day two. So thank you very much. We'll see you tomorrow. Hello and welcome to day three of the ultimate Git five day challenge. So today we reached the halfway point and what we're going to do today is very simply clone a remote repository to our local machine. So essentially we've already set up a remote repository at either GitHub or Bitbucket and we want to clone that down to our local machine so that we can start working against it. So this would bring all the files from that remote repository to our machine in the exact state that they are as they were last committed and pushed out to that remote repository. So we'll see and learn a little bit about that as we go for the rest of the course.
But what we really want to do today is just get those references set up. So now GitHub is a public repository. And so to clone it, we don't require any permission. Since it's public, it's available to anyone to clone. So even if you didn't do the Bitbucket activities going to this point, I would like you to watch the Bitbucket cloning because that's a private repository. And mainly the big difference there is that we have to enter credentials. So I guess if you really didn't want to watch it, you wouldn't have to. But it just gives you a little bit of exposure to that if you're interested in seeing what it might look like doing the same thing that you would do against GitHub, only this time with some credentials that you're entering. With that, we're ready to get started for day three. So here we go. Let's get started. Hello and welcome to our next video. In this lesson, we're going to take the time to clone a public repo. And so we already set up a repo at GitHub in a previous video. So if you haven't done that, you'll need to go back and do that to follow along with this. And basically, once you have all your GitHub information set up and your repo created, when you log back in, you'll see that you have some repositories listed. I have one here and it's called First Repo. So that's one way that I can get to my repos. So I can just click on this. If I had more, I could do a search. Once I click on this, I'll drill in. It tells me that I'm Major Guidance Solutions and this is First Repo. It has one commit and I'm basically the only person that's the contributor and there's some different information about you know, when the files were created and what files are in the repo right now. And so there we have all the information that we need, except for we don't have the actual link to clone our repo. So what I can do is click on this clone or download button, and it will tell me that I can clone using SSH or HTTPS. Now we're gonna be using HTTPS just directly over the web, and I can just click on this simple clipboard, and it'll tell me that it copied it. Now if you weren't interested in cloning the repo and you just want the repo for your own use, you could download the zip. And that would give you the chance to just put the repo on your machine without having to actually do the clone. But we're actually going to do a clone today. So this is the same state that I was in on the other machine there. And basically I have my data folder with my git from beginner to fearless folder. And in there is the second repo that we created with the git repo in there. If you're on Windows and you can't see this, make sure that you have hidden folders and files shown and you would see your, your Git files and things in there. And so it's basically the same setup that we had, but I wanted to have a very clean machine to show you all of this, so that's why I'm doing it this way. I have this repo and I want to clone it. So right now I'm in second repo, so I want to actually get back a level and be in data slash Git for beginner to fearless folder where I want to live. And I'm going to say git clone. And then what I need to do is enter that URL that I copied. So hopefully I can right click and paste. And there it is. And it's HTTPS. And then you should see something very similar. GitHub.com, your username, first repo.git. So once you have that, go ahead and hit enter. And that will cloning into first repo. And you can see it's unpacking. And we should have here in just a few seconds our folder. So I'm just going to ls. And what I can see here is I have first repo and second repo, and I can drill in by changing directory into first repo and ls again. And I can see I have my license and my readme files that exist, and I'm on the master for that first repo. Now that's really all there is to cloning a repo. What that has done is given me the chance to download the files that exist in the repo in the exact state that they existed at the time that they were checked in to the last commit on that repo. And so, you know, that's a lot of terminology right now, but essentially everything as it exists in the state right now has been directly downloaded and copied to my machine on my first repo directory. So I have everything right there and I can work with it. Now, if you're using Linux, you're gonna see, you know, the same exact type of thing when you clone, the same thing with a Mac. And so we're not gonna redo videos for that, but you'll wanna just go ahead and you know, follow along as we go from now on and just typing the commands, they're all gonna work the same from the terminal that you see here in Git Bash. Well, that wraps up our look at cloning a public repo. Thank you very much, and we'll see you next time. Hello and welcome to our next video. In this lesson, we're gonna take the time to clone a private repository to our local directory. And so what we're gonna do is go out to our Bitbucket repository that we had created, 
And so we already cloned the first repo from GitHub. And so we would have a directory conflict if we were to just try to get the directory right here. So what I'm going to do is just make a new directory called vitbucket. And so I can put my first repo inside of there and not have to worry about any naming conflict. But what I need to do is actually go out to my Bitbucket repository. And what we'll see here is that I have some different repositories for myself. And the only one that I show is first repo. So I'm going to drill into that. And I'm going to go down to I'm starting from scratch. And I'm going to grab this git clone line with the link to my repository. We'll be using HTTPS. And you do have HTTPS and SSH options available, but we'll be using HTTPS. You can see the code right here that you would need to do to do some stuff. And what we're really going to care about is this first line, which has clone, and then the link to our repo, our major guidance solutions, first repo.git. Of course, yours should be something similar. And remember that you can't use mine because mine is private and you won't have my password. So I'm going to go ahead and just paste that command in here. Again, it's git clone and then the link to your repo. First time you hit this, you should be asked for a password. And so that will pop up in Windows like this. So you need to enter your Bitbucket credentials the first time. And so here I'm using Major Guidance Solutions. And I enter my password. And it says, warning, you have cloned an empty repository. And that's okay, there's nothing in it. So if I go ahead and cd into first repo, the only thing that's there right now is the hidden git folder. And so I could actually go into that. And you can see there I'm inside the git directory. And so basically there's nothing much to do at this point. And so now the fact is that I have my first repo. I'm going to go ahead and actually delete it real quick, though, just to show that since I'm on Windows, I'm using a credential manager. And if I were to look at my git config, dash dash global, dash dash git credential dot helper, and see that my credential helper is a manager here on Windows. And so if you don't see manager there, then you don't have any credential manager set up on your machine. And you may need to look into putting a credential store or credential cache in place so that you can actually save your password if you want to do that. Otherwise, you could just enter your password every time. But now, since I've deleted everything here, oops, I forgot to rm-rf the first repo. So now I've deleted everything. I can go ahead and bring up my command to clone again. And when I bring that down this time, I don't need to enter my username and password because my credentials are stored in the credential manager. One last thing about Windows, it's very easy to work with your credential manager. If you go to your control panel, you can actually see your credentials by typing in credential manager in the run block. And that brings up your credential manager for Windows. Let me make this just a little smaller here. Bear with me a second. And essentially, under Windows Credentials here, you'll see that there's my Bitbucket credentials. If I decided I wanted to change my password, I could do that. If I want to remove it, I can do that here as well. And so that just makes it very easy for me to go ahead and be able to store and remove my passwords for Git using that credential manager that's built into Windows. It comes along with the Git installation that we already did. But that wraps up our look at cloning a private repository. Thank you very much, and we'll see you next time. Hello and welcome to our reflection on day three of the Ultimate Git 5-Day Challenge. So today we went about cloning the repository that we had stored at a remote location to get it to a local repository on our machine and have all the references set in order so that we could start working with it tomorrow. Now basically, this involved using Git clone, and for GitHub with the public repository, we were able to clone without entering any credentials. However, when using Bitbucket in a private repository, we're required to enter our username and password. And this, of course, makes sense because we wouldn't want just anyone to get our code if we're trying to keep it private. But in a public repository, there's no reason that someone shouldn't be able to clone our code. And so that wraps up day three, where we cloned our repositories to our local machine. 
I'm looking forward to seeing you tomorrow in day four when we'll move forward with working against our local repository and ultimately then getting that out to our remote repository. So we'll see you tomorrow for day four. Hello and welcome to day four of the ultimate get five day challenge. So today will probably be our most difficult day and probably the most critical for learning what we want to learn in this course. So that's going to be pretty exciting, but you may want to practice the steps from this day over and over again a few times in order to really get it down to understand a little bit about the workflow and how it actually works. So again, as this course is just kind of a quick overview, we're not actually going to take the time to learn deeply about the flow of how Git works, but I'm going to show you a practical way that you can go about making some changes to your files, adding them to index, committing them so that they're at the head on your local repo, and then ultimately pushing that out to GitHub or Bitbucket. So here we're just going to push to GitHub today, but you would be able to do the same thing for Bitbucket should you be working against Bitbucket. So get ready to be challenged and get ready to see how things work when we're working against our local repository and then pushing our changes out so that they will be saved at the remote repository. So let's go ahead and get started with day four. Hello and welcome to our next video. In this lesson, we're going to actually make some changes and for the first time, we'll actually track a file by adding it. We'll then commit those changes using commit and we'll ultimately push those changes from our local repository up to our remote repository. So right now, the current state of my directory is that I have the Bitbucket stuff, I have a first repo, which is a direct clone from GitHub, and I have a second repo, which is only a local repository. It's never been pushed to any remote. What we're gonna be doing is using GitHub, the first repo here, and I'll be doing this on Windows. And for the most part going forward, the demonstrations will be in Git Bash on Windows, and I'll be using GitHub as my primary repository. But there's nothing that I'm gonna be doing here that you can't recreate on a Linux or a Mac. And there's no reason, if you so desire, that you couldn't use Bitbucket. So it's a personal choice for you at this point. If you have all that wired up, great. Go ahead and use whatever you're feeling the most comfortable. Again, for us, I'm using Windows, Git Bash, and I'm going to be going directly against GitHub. So I'm going to go ahead and CD into the first repo directory that we pulled down, and I'm just going to ls-al to make sure that everything's there. Looks like I got my git ignore and my git folder, and then I have a license and a readme that I pulled down directly from my repo. And if I look at the repo out on GitHub, you can see that, again, this is what I'm expecting to see, so that's good. All right, so the first thing we're gonna do is just create a file, and we're just gonna call it hello world.html. And so basically, this is just gonna be a default HTML page and here we have hello world.html. So I'm going to go ahead and go into VI here for hello world.html. And there's nothing in there. So what I would do, hit I for insert. Then I would just say HTML body. I guess we probably want a head, don't we? We can just do title, etc. So really, we're not doing anything useful here. And really what we're trying to show is that we have, you know, something that we're coding, something that we're trying to save. And then the body, let's just do a H1. Hello world. And then we'll exit out of the body and we'll exit out of HTML. So very basic stuff. So I'm going to hit uh, escape colon WQ to write and quit. So what I see right now is that I created that file. LS-AL will show me that the file's there. If I want to see what's not tracked yet, and we'll see some more about this in another video, but basically what I'm showing here is that hello world.html is ready to be tracked. It's Right now it's untracked, and so get status has shown me that. It's red for being untracked. So what I want to do is actually add this to my directory. 
I'm going to say git add, and I'm actually just going to add it by the file name. And yes, okay, that's fine. Line feeds and stuff will be replaced, and that's okay. And so let's go ahead and just do a git status again real quick to see. And now you see it's green, new file, and it basically says that it's changes ready to be committed. So I want to go ahead and commit this and make my change solid into my repository locally. So what I'm going to say is git commit, and I'm going to say dash m to add a commit message, and that's going to be my hello world, or let's make this more useful, added hello world stub file, something useful. Go ahead and do that, and it says, hey, look, git commit master 9bc2fd0 added hello world stub file, one file change, eight insertions, create mode, etc. hello world.html. If I do a git status, my directory should be clear. It says, yeah, your branch is ahead by one commit, which is great. Locally, I'm ahead of master on GitHub, and I expect that. And there's nothing to commit. My working tree is clean. So I have successfully added a file, made some changes to it, committed it to my local repository. The last thing I want to do is actually now move these changes from my local repository into the remote repository. So what I'm going to do is git push origin master. And right now, I have not logged in with my GitHub credentials. Before, I had just cloned, and so everything was public. I didn't need to enter credentials, but now in order to write back to my GitHub, I need to enter my credentials. The other thing is, again, since I'm on Windows, I'm using the credential manager. When we installed, that was installed. So once I do this once, I shouldn't have to do this anymore. And so I just enter my email, which is brian at major guidance solutions. And my password for GitHub. And I go ahead and log in. And hopefully I got that right. And it says, yes, okay. It says compressing, done, writing objects, resolving deltas, completed with one local object to GitHub, major guidance first repo, gave me commit matching commit that I did and master to master from the branches that I was on. And ultimately that pushed my changes. Now the really cool thing is I can go out to my GitHub and I can see that I've had, if I refresh here, I've got a new commit that showed up and it says, Brian added hello world stub file. And ultimately that was the commit that I just did. If I drill into that, you can see there's the code that I added, hello world.html. And that was on that commit that was local. And you can see here on my first repo now that I have my hello world.html right there on the root. And if I actually drill into it, I can see the file right there on GitHub. But that wraps up our video on creating a file, making a change, and pushing that change out to GitHub. Thank you very much, and we'll see you next Hello, and welcome to day four reflection for the ultimate Git five day challenge. So today we went through quite a bit of stuff and we learned how to work on our local file system, make changes, add those changes to our index on our repository, commit that change so that the changes would be moved into the head, and then ultimately push those changes out to our remote repository. So right there, we have the basic workflow that you would need if you are an individual developer or an individual person working alone on a project. And I'm assuming a lot of you are, and that's why you're here. You're trying to learn how you can save your important files and get them out to a remote repository and have version control. So you're already set up and ready to do that. So if you wanted, you could practice by going back to day one and creating a new repository for your important files and then skip to day three and clone that repository down to your local machine. And then drag and drop your files into that folder and do the add, commit, and push, and suddenly your important files are now in version control. So that's pretty awesome. Also, I would take some time at this point to practice this process. You wouldn't have to do a lot of work. You could continue to work on the repository we've been using and just make simple changes, add, commit, and push them. This will give you a lot of practice, and it's a really good idea to master this. And again, since this is a small overview course, 
this workflow is really only valid for a single developer or a single person. But again, the workflow is very similar to what you would need to do in any situation. So go ahead and practice and get this process mastered because we've now wrapped up day four and I'll see you tomorrow for the end of the course. Hello and welcome to day five, the final day of the ultimate get five day challenge. So today we're going to complete our study in this course by making a change at the remote repository and then pulling that change down to our local repository. Now this operation is important because if anybody else had made changes to the files in order to get your code to where it needs to be or get your files to where they need to be, you have to pull the current version down so that your local repository lines up with the history of your remote repository. If you're the only one working on your files and you're basically changing your files locally and pushing them out to your remote repository, you probably don't have to worry about this too much. But at some point if you're working with Git and you have more than one person, or you start learning about branches, at some point you're probably going to want to pull the changes and make your local repository line up with the remote repository. So today what we're going to do is make a simple change to some files out at our remote repository and then pull those down to our local repository. So let's go ahead and get started with day five of the ultimate get five day challenge. Hello and welcome to our next video. In this lesson, we're going to make some changes to our repository directly at GitHub, which is going to sort of simulate someone else making changes to the code and us needing to get a local version to work on locally after those changes have been made in our repository. Now, we're going to simulate this by just doing a simple change here at GitHub, and then we're going to use the git pull command to bring those code changes down to our local repository. So here I've got my hello world.html, which we just pushed in from a previous video. And so you, if you've been following along, you should have a first repo at GitHub. You should have some sort of file structure and something that you can actually modify at this point. You could change the readme if you wanted to. That's all you have there. No problem. So what I want to do is actually just go directly into that file. And I'm going to say, yeah, there's, you know, this is an HTML file. I really should have put doc type. HTML on the top, right? And so I'm going to say, okay, that's awesome. And what I want to do now is save this. And so go down here and I'm going to give it a message added doc type. To the top of the file. And then if you wanted to add more, you could. And there's some crazy options here for committing directly to the master branch, creating a new branch for this commit and start a pull request. We don't know what that is yet, so let's just commit directly to the master branch for now. Now, as a caveat to that, when you're developing in any sort of situation, if you only have you know, a master branch, great, but most likely that's not going to be the case. And you're going to have some sort of master branch that you probably don't want to commit directly to without having code reviews and things like that. And that's where branching and pull requests come into play. But again, we'll get to those at another point. So I just want to say that because ordinarily I wouldn't just commit directly to the master branch. Even if I was making this simple of a change, I would probably create a new branch, send that off for a pull request, have that someone else review it, and then do what's called a merge backend. We'll see all that in another video, so don't worry about that right now. For now, just go ahead and commit directly to the master branch, select commit changes, and it'll be done. And it'll say, you know, now in my first repo, if I go back, I have three commits. I can look at those different commits and you can see here is there my added my doc type. If I drill into that, I see that there's the code that I added. It's exactly what I expected. And again, my first repo now has three commits and that hello world should have that doc type on the top of the file. Well, now if I'm the developer, back on my machine and I want to start working with that new HTML file right now if we look at it we don't have that doc type and that's expected so I'm escape colon quitting and that's going to give me a chance to see how do I get my changes that were committed at the remote repository back to my local repository so that I have the most up-to-date version so what I want to do is called git pull origin master since I'm on the master branch, there is only a master branch. The origin is my GitHub 
repo, HTTPS, etc. And so I'm using git pull from that repo into my master here locally. So we'll go ahead and hit enter. And it says, okay, counting done, compressing done, total three, etc. Updating to the new commit ID, fast forward, hello world, added one. So one file changed, one insertion. And so you can see the information here about the commit, which is a fast forward because it basically just moved forward in the chain. We'll learn about some of that stuff as we go as well. There was no conflict. It basically was able to just add that and reset my history so that I'm at the same place as the master now. And in fact, if I did a git status, it would say your branch is up to date with origin master, nothing to commit, your working tree is clean. And once I go back into hello world, now I have my doc type HTML that was done remotely by someone else and checked into the remote repository. And now I pulled it down and I can keep working just like I had made those changes myself. So I'm going to escape colon quit again. But that is going to wrap up our video on pulling changes from a remote repository into our local repository. Thank you very much, and we'll see you next time. Hello and welcome to the reflection on day five of the ultimate Git five day challenge. So we've completed all of the activities at this point for the course. We spent today going out to GitHub and making some changes on our remote repository, and then learning how to pull those changes down to our local repository. So once again, this is an important feature as you work with other people and they make changes on the repository. Or if you learn about branches and need to pull down the different branches as you go, that will be important as well. So we're not going to go into that level in this course, but that's stuff to definitely get on your radar. However, as an individual, at this point, you've seen quite a bit with Git and you're already able to work with a local and remote repository in a way that you could continue to make changes to your files and keep your source control tracking in place. Well, that wraps up day five of the ultimate five day Git challenge. Thank you very much. We'll see you next time. Hey everybody, welcome to the end of the course. So you did it, congratulations. I'm really excited that you made it all this way and I hope that you will continue to dive into the world of Git after this course is completed. So I just wanted to take a moment to go over again as a reflection and just as a reminder the things that we learned during this course but also to talk a little bit about the things we didn't learn. So first of all we started out in day one by just getting an account at GitHub or Bitbucket and then setting up a remote repository. We then took day two to get Git on our local machines. Once we had that, we created a local repository using the git init command. During day three, we then went out and cloned our remote repository to our local repository. And on day four, we did the bulk of our work where we made some changes, added them, committed, and pushed out to our remote repository. Finally, on day five, we were able to make some changes at the remote repository and then pull those changes to our local repository. So we basically learned the essential Git flow for a single person, but we didn't really learn what it would take if you were working with a team or if you were wanting to make branches. And we certainly didn't learn any of the more advanced commands about how we could do some reset or reverting or perhaps even do some rebasing. So there's plenty more to learn with Git. We've essentially scratched the surface and learned the basic commands for basic workflow for a single person. That wraps up this little reflection on the course and what we learned and didn't learn. Thank you very much, and we'll see you next time. Hello everyone. This is the final video for the Ultimate Git 5 Day Challenge. What I wanted to do was take one last moment with you just to talk about some next steps and just conclude the course officially. So. When we went through this course, we learned the basic Git workflow. We learned about what it would take to work with a repository locally and remotely, basically as one person. Now, if you want to take a deep dive into Git, obviously there are some new things to learn. I wanted to get you to the point where you have this part down though, because once you master this, the other stuff becomes a lot easier rather than trying to muddy the waters with the other stuff while you're trying to learn this as well. 
But now that you have this down, the next step would be learn about branching and learn about working with teams. So basically, you're going to encounter things like merging, where you'd have to handle any kind of conflicts that exist. You're going to learn about what it would take to create a branch or switch branches when you're trying to work on different parts of your system or your files or whatever you're doing. So obviously there are many different resources available for you to do this. I am also offering a course which you could take that takes a deeper dive into Git. In my course, Git from Beginner to Fearless, we're going to go over a lot more information about Git. We'll take a deeper dive into how it would take to set up the Git config for your, some of your credentials. We'll take a look at using a different tool to do merging and diff. And we'll take a deep look at some different workflows for a single developer or a single person, a team. We'll talk about things like merging and merge conflicts, what it takes to do pull requests. And then we'll also do some of the more advanced commands as we dive deeper like rebasing, resetting, reverting. We'll take a look at all of that stuff and what it would take to do some of the more practical things with Git that you would encounter in a daily workflow. Either way, there are plenty of resources available for you if you wish to continue your journey with Git, and I hope that you will. I've appreciated the time that you've spent with me here in this course. I hope that you learned a lot and feel that it was valuable and a good use of your time. Please feel free to give me feedback anytime. I'd love to hear your thoughts and hear how the course went for you. But that wraps up the ultimate Git 5-Day Challenge. Thank you so much, and all the best to you in the future.